Why would such experienced hikers unnecessarily risk their lives in sub-zero elements? And if they lost their lives due to extreme weather, why were some of their injuries so unnatural? Could this entire experience be a government cover-up? Today, we test the believability of the Dyatlov Pass incident. Welcome to Believing the Bizarre, where we dive into the unknown and the unusual and tell you whether or not we find it believable. That is right. It is Tuesday. I hope you enjoyed every second of that Baker Mayfield episode. I know I did. Happy birthday to me. It was a really interesting discussion. Yeah. Was it real? No. <laughs> Do I still love him? Yes. And there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot in this story and stuff I don't even know about that's relevant now that you're going to talk about. Yeah, this story is uh, thick, although I know the answer. You know the answer? Yeah. I got like seven theories at the end, so I'm interested in to hear what you think the answer is. Okay. Because um, I'm, I'm going into this completely open to the discussion. I don't have an answer or a solution that I've chosen. I'm willing to be malleable, but there is a couple that I definitely don't buy. Okay. Which I think is fair. There's There's many of them. With any great conspiracy, there's there are conclusions that people jump to that are almost silly. Yeah, absolutely. I heard somebody said that there were like 70 theories around this. I don't even think I could come up with 70 theories to anything. Th- no. That's a lot. That's yeah, a lot. That's a whole lot. Also, I just want to say this now. I will not be saying all of their names. Like, I, there's, like, for, the, for the humanity of their families and their legacy, I'm not going to butcher that. Like, there's a couple names I'll drop. But I'm not going into that. I apologize. And I'm, I want to say that up front so nobody gets offended when I say, like, the hikers. Yeah. Or this hiker. They're very Russian. Very, very Russian. So without further ado, are you ready to dive into this story? The hike. So this Soviet Union hiking mystery takes place in 1959, and it begins in late January trekking through the Ural Mountains. The expedition was led by Igor Dyatlov, one of the only names I'm going to say, because it's kind of, you know, it's his namesake. And he was a 23-year-old student at Ural Polytechnical Institute. And for this expedition, he assembled a group of other students and friends to do this hike. Again, not getting super into the names. You can look them up. They're everywhere. It's a super popular story. I'm going to be discussing, for the most part, the group of hikers as a whole, like they're one one entity here. It's also important to note that each member of the group was a grade two certified hiker who was trying to get their level three certification, which at the time in the 50s was the highest possible. I have no idea. I have no idea what you can get now. Oh, man, I am a grade zero certified <laughs> hiker. I, I do enjoy my hiking. I don't think I have a certification. If you watched me in some hiking instances, it probably wouldn't look very good. Is it like a class you take or like, well, how do you get certified? You think you get a plaque? I don't know. Well, you have to travel. I think what they said, you had to travel 190 miles to be level three, but I don't think that's all. Maybe you have to have those sticks. You know what I'm talking about? When you see those people (laughs) walking with sticks, you have to have your own pair of those, or maybe, maybe that's your certification. When you get it, they'll send you those sticks. Oh, like silver sticks. Yeah. You just got to say like how tall you are. And they'll send them to you made out of titanium or some shit. I wonder if you go down like the, the Appalachian trail, thing the the big one in the appalachians i wonder if that is for like level three i don't know i feel like appalachians are like one of the smaller ranges right i feel like you'd have to go the rockies or something no there's like this whole big trail that goes down like the whole coast of the united states in the appalachian mountains all right never mind there's this great place you know about 20 minutes from my house there's like a waterfall there excellent so why does this matter that we're even talking about the certification well It's important to know that these hikers were highly trained and skilled. They were not amateurs because there's some details that we're going to get to later that are going to kind of conflict with what you would expect an experienced hiker to do or not do. So essentially that was the goal. So let's talk about the plan. The group was set to hike for 21 days, 11 days to the top of Mount Ortorton and 10 days back. And this includes trains and buses and skiing 
and hiking. Essentially, they were going to cover 800 miles. So they could be like level certification 9 or 10. All the metals, all the sticks. And they were going pretty much straight north. So they were going from really, really cold Russia weather to extremely cold Russia weather. Freezing. So the hike itself was already going to be challenging, but the fact that they chose to go during the winter month made it even harder and more dangerous. Seems like a bad decision. But they needed that level three, you know what I mean? Maybe that was their only free time. Uh, okay, nothing nothing sure. was going down in the January and February months in 1959. So, on January 23rd, 1959, the 10 members of the Dyatlov group met up and they were issued their route book, which listed their hiking course. The group got to know each other and they dove into deep discussions about life and love and excitement for the trip. No small talk here. How do we know that? We know that because even though they were traveling relatively lightly for the trip, they did have a shared journal that they would pass around. They would all take turns writing their experiences, their thoughts, kind of detailing the paths that they took. And beyond just a a cool souvenir and something that they can document their trip, apparently that journal was also important to their certification. Like it kind of detailed their experience. So So, at the end, like who gets to keep it? (laughs) Maybe they just rip out the pages that they wrote and like you rip a page in half if you wrote some of it. I, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it just goes to the school, the Polytechnical Institute. I don't even know where it is now. They found it, but mm. I, I I don't know. You can rent it at the library. <laughs> <laughs> you have to return it after four days. <laughs> actually, if it's like comprehensible, I wonder if that's actually a really good book. I don't know. It's probably written in Russian. Well, if it got translated. Google Translate that shit, yeah. <laughs> you would need all four days to do that. On a side note, one of the hikers also brought a mandolin. Oh, okay. Priorities, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I get it. Okay, so if that sounds fun when you're at, like, the train stop and when you're at on the bus. When you are halfway up a mountain and it's negative 15 degrees, probably don't want that mandolin on you. <laughs> you're like, f***ing Sergey, shut the f*** up. <laughs> <laughs> you burn it for fire. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So, without wasting any time, the journey began right there on January 23rd. First, they took a train to Ifdel by January 25th, and they had a day or so layover, and then they took a truck to Vijay, which was their final stop before they began their hike to the top of Mount Ortorton on January 27th. Now, I saw it listed also as Gora Ortorton. I think that's its full name. But if you're on, like, first name basis with it's it... It's like its formal name is yeah, Gora. Gora or Torton. But for the for the remainder of this episode, it's Mount or Torton. Yeah, these guys better be friends with it if it happens. Yeah. And I don't know what city this happened in when exactly it occurred. I kind of saw conflicting articles. But at some point along their trip, they hired a guide, an expert guide, to help them along the way who knew how to get up the mountain. Yeah. You would think based on the premise of the story that maybe he failed, but it, it, it actually isn't in his fault. Because even though the hike had just begun, essentially, I mean, they still, it was still was a rough trip. They were still fighting the elements and pushing their bodies to the limit. They had poor sleep. They had to sleep at layovers. They actually went to a school at one point and asked if they could sleep there. They had a run in with the Soviet Union police who didn't like outsiders, even though they were Russian. I don't know the full extent of that, but Pretty much like they had like a six six or seven hour layover and they couldn't go inside the station. They had to stay outside and it was cold. So they're already feeling a ton of exhaustion. And one particular hiker, Yuri, had been suffering from a few nagging ailments, including acute pain, knee pain, joint pain. He was like one of those infomercials with old people. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Where they're just like oh, in pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it highlights it like freeze frames on the blue and you can see like the hot points you're like oh that's what my knee looks like yeah but you he sh- should got one of those uh rollers right you have one of those rollers foam rollers yeah you should got a foam roller on january 28th with all due respect yuri said F- this and he actually turned around he quit i don't blame him i know i don't either i i mean does he have his level three certification no did he have his life until 2013 yes so I think you could argue that maybe he made a smart decision. And I saw that the guide, this is where the guide comes into play. Apparently the guide escorted him back. So the guide now left. So the group of 11, the 10 students in Dyatlov and the guide have now turned into just the nine group of nine. The fellowship, as you might say. Oh, yeah. Their, their success rate was a little bit lower than... Uh, Oof, they didn't I, make it to Mordor. Lord of the Rings tells you that humans fail. And so this goes according to plan. 
So the next day, January 29th, was reported in the journal as negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. But the group wanted to get as much ground as possible to hit the peak, basically start their descent and get to warmer temperatures as soon as they could. So they decided to continue trudging forward. And I think this is understandable because they don't really know each other. Poor sleep, so sleep deprivation, incredibly cold temperatures, tension was starting to set in. Mm. They had to alter their path. The river that they were intending to follow was like frozen over or something like that. So they had to go more inward on land. They weren't able to read some of the signs. Uh, the local tribe there is called the Manzi tribe. They weren't able to identify some of those markings. And they weren't getting along quite as well as they did that first night. The, the, the love and the life discussions now turn into kind of a bitter silence. One issue that was reported in the journal was... Igor had constructed a super customized huge tent that fit 11 people. So naturally, it'd be great for the nine people. And it even had, I guess, like zipper sections. So like you could have a little bit of privacy and even had a little mini stove. Just kind of cool. Yeah. But there was an opening in there, obviously, where the it would zip open. And that was the coldest section of the tent. And they all voted to put one particular hiker by the, by the open area without letting him vote they pretty much said hey you're gonna go over there <laughs> so already with poor sleep and freezing throughout the night he would just kind of do these tantrum outbursts so even if they were able to fall asleep he would just wake them up so he's just screaming in the middle of the night just, ah! <laughs> so tensions were high again poor sleep cold weather and the snow was getting really wet and sludgy and it was theorized that they weren't able to go at any faster of a pace than one miles per hour. Oh my gosh, that's so, you're, so grueling. You're going up a mountain in snow, negative 15 degrees, and you're moving at a snail's pace. That is, that's going to be so frustrating. This is when you regret the mandolin. I think <laughs> this is the moment. This is the moment. They broke that against an ice block long ago. <laughs> for fire for the mini stove. They mm -hmm. ate it. They ate that mandolin. On the 31st of January, the group reached the edge of a highland area, and they begin preparing to actually climb the mountain. On February 1st, the hikers started to move through the pass. However, the weather conditions started to get much worse beyond just the fact that it was freezing. They started experiencing snowstorms and incredibly poor visibility, which made them lose their direction, and they actually started heading west instead of north. So instead of heading to the top of Mount Ortorton, they were actually heading up the mountain. Kolat Sekil. I'll tell you this, though. It ironically translates to Dead Mountain. Damn. Damn. By the time they discovered this mistake, they decided that it was best to just camp on the slope of the mountain instead of heading back down and descend to a forested area. And it's speculated that they made this decision because, one, lack of energy. Even if it's going down, it still would take energy and time to go down. And two, they think they didn't want to lose any elevation because however far they went down, they were going to have to re-travel back up. So why lose the elevation? Man, this is like that Morgan, Morgan Freeman voice goes, at that moment, they'd f***ed up. <laughs> exactly. And if somebody, if somebody would have said that to him, maybe they'd still be alive. But unfortunately, <laughs> we've gotten to the incident. What is a pass? You go through it. It's like, um, you know, like if there's a wall and you can't go through it, yeah. you can't pass through it. <laughs> or there's a bounce pass in basketball. There's a chess pass. You can pass in volleyball. Is it like, like, a, like a thing? Baker Mayfield is excellent at the deep pass. What is it? What is it? What is a pass? Sort of, is it like two walls? This like is what I imagine. I Seriously, I don't know. But I think it's like when, like a clearing that you're heading up something. Like okay. if there's two, like if you're not in a valley, but like a, a certain path that you're intended to go up. Okay. I don't know. Uh, I was just wondering if you knew. All right. So I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this, the way that you like to tell stories. And I'm going to mess up the chronologicalness of it. I'm going to treat it the way that the investigators did. So the trip was expected to last 21 days from January 23rd to February 12th. And it was expected that on February 12th, they would arrive back at the city of Vijay. But February 12th came and it went without any word from the group. But due to the challenge of the hike, it was expected that an extra day or two might be necessary. 
Plus, you know, they didn't have any cell phones to let their friends and family know that they were taking extra time or that they died. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I understand. Cell phone would go a long way. Did you ever see the family guy where, like, they go hiking up Everest? Uh, maybe not. There's a really, like, they have to, they, they're trying to compete with this family and then they end up eating the family's kid. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's dark. one of those, it's one of those excellent ending moments where they're like, they, they bring the family, the parents to the, the helicopter and they're like, all right, you guys will be fine. We'll be safe. You'll be good. You'll be good. We ate your kid. All right, take them up. And then they just <laughs> Love that humor. Anyways, it wasn't until February 20th that the group's friends and family started voicing their concerns and actually started a volunteer search and rescue group. They're like, this ain't right. And you know what? Hearing that, I'm surprised they didn't die too. (laughs) I don't know where they're at. Let's go look. And then they all died too. So they're actually pretty lucky, I think, to be alive. The search party? Yeah, they just got on Google Maps and they started looking around. I don't see them. They probably use like snowmobiles and stuff. Oh, yeah. They had snowmobiles. They had helicopters. They had planes. I don't know how... How good is a plane on a rescue mission? You can't really... I mean, you'll find them, but you can't really... Well, ima- s- small planes can go pretty low. You're a plane, and you're flying over, and you're like, we found them. And then, like, shh, that's great. Where were they? And, like, oh, shit. I, 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 uh, there <laughs> they was, definitely there were, had coordinates. There were trees. I promise <laughs> you, there were trees. And a tent. So, six days later from when the investigation started, on February 26th, they spotted the tent. And here's where things get weird. It had been ripped open from the inside, completely slashed on one side, about waist level or eye level, if you're sitting down looking out, and then completely cut on one side for escape. Most of the hiker's personal belongings, clothes, food, and shoes were still in the tent. Even the mini stove was still in its case, unopened, so basically, they didn't even try heating anything that night. Kind of shows the exhausted mindset yeah. that they were in. So whatever happened, the hikers left incredibly fast, cutting their way out of the tent, leaving clothes and personal items behind as they ventured ill-prepared into the Arctic weather and the heavy snowfall. Some of them left without shoes on. Like, like if they examined the footprints, you could see some of them were in socks and some of them were barefoot. These are experienced hikers. So, obviously, we're going to get into some of the theories later. But just keep in mind, these aren't amateurs. These are experienced hikers. And something freaked them out so bad that they literally cut their way out of their tent and ran into the sub-zero temperatures not prepared for it. Man, I don't even like to walk on cold cement with bare feet. Mm -mm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. So they're looking around, they're looking around the tent, trying to find any signs of these hikers. And about 1,500 feet away from the tent, under a huge pine tree by the edge of the forest, the forested area that they decided not to camp in, they found the remains of a small fire. Okay, so someone built a fire. Somebody built a fire outside. (laughs) Okay. And they also found two bodies, the first two bodies. By the fire. By the fire. They were only in their underwear... And they had died of hypothermia. One of the hikers had third degree burns on their foot. So it's assumed that they were literally so cold, they stuck their foot in the fire to warm up. Trying to cook himself. <laughs> trying to, you know, he was, maybe he was hungry too. Maybe the other person was trying to cook the other person. Oh, that's dark. Maybe. Well, not any darker than them trying to eat themselves. After a little more searching, they found three more corpses that had died of hypothermia, and they were found in positions like they were crawling back to the tent. They were a couple hundred feet separate from each other, but those three were... So they realized they'd made mistakes. Well, when they left the tent, at some point they decided to go back to the tent, and this this is where they had passed. This was one of those bodies, one of those three bodies on the path back to the tent that died of hypothermia in those poses was uh, Igor Dyatlov. That was, Uh, he was one of them. Gotcha. And that was all they found for two months. Dang. Just the five. No idea where the other four were. Until a few months later, under about 13 feet of snow in a river, in the woods, the final four bodies were found. Together? I don't know how close they were together, but they were all in the same general area. Like, they found the four of them at the same time. Now, they'd been more 
prepared for the sub-zero temperature. They were actually wearing clothing. A couple of them were actually found with clothing that had belonged to the dead folks from above. So the people that were closer to the tent, that were less dressed for it, the four in the river were wearing some of their clothes. Now, whether or not that was taken from the tent or it was taken off the dead bodies, we don't know. But here's where it gets even weirder. Their injuries. Now, obviously, one of the major mysteries is why they left the tent in horror. Ill prepared for the weather, but the original five bodies were just simply hypothermia. They left, they weren't dressed right, it was cold, they died. It's still tragic, but that's, you know, that's what it is. These other four, it's different. One of the bodies had major skull damage. One of them had a nick in their skull. Two had severe chest trauma, which they said was like, it looked like they had been hit by a car. Like you couldn't see it externally, but internally their damages, it was like getting hit by a car. But again, no external, no wounds, no cuts, just force, a pressure. Even stranger, two of the bodies were missing their eyeballs. One was missing an eyebrow that had been ripped out so deeply that you could see the skull and one of them was missing their tongue. A couple of them had deep brown skin, which was not in the investigative report, but some of the family members later on at their funerals observed this because it was an open casket. They noticed that some of their skin was as red as brick and one of them was claimed to have grayish green skin with purple dots on it. Also, as if all that wasn't enough, there were also levels of radiation on one of the bodies, on their clothing, which was actually diluted because in the running water, the water would dilute the radiation. So we have no way of knowing how much radiation was actually on the body. We just know when it was discovered in the water, it had levels of radiation on it. So let's do a quick recap before we dive into some of the theories. Okay. One, they were experienced excellent hikers. Two, the tent was cut open from within. Three, they all left on their own accord, poorly dressed for sub-zero temperatures at a normal pace. If you look at the footprints, they're not running. They're not rushing at a normal pace into the cold, not prepared. They left the tent. I'm sure that was a very sane conversation. <laughs> hey, you guys want to go out? Uh, I don't. I don't know. We're not really. I dressed really. For it. I really want to look at the stars. I'm just really excited for it. Let's just go. But do you want to get dressed? No. Let's cut it out. Cut out of the tent. I don't want to wear my clothes. Can I wear your clothes? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just gonna wear my underwear. I'm feeling, <laughs> I'm feeling good. I actually. I was on keto this week. <laughs> Four. Six of them died from hypothermia. Five. Three of them died from physical trauma without showing exterior wounds. Six. The ones that died from physical trauma could not have been done by a human. We're talking car accident, major intensive pressure wounds. Not like one of them punched the other person. Like this is huge force. Seven, eyes, eyebrows, facial tissue, and a tongue was missing. Eight, radiation levels were found on one of the bodies. So all of that being said, what could have happened? Let's dive into some of the theories. And this is not yet the discussion. This is the theories. Okay, theory time. Now, I just want to frame the episode this way, because the way we started it, it was testing the believability of the Diad Love Pass incident. Well, it happened. Believable. <laughs> so the way I want to frame it, I know we haven't hit the discussion yet. I, I'm, I'm prefacing this so that you can think about it while we're going through these theories. Okay. Here's the way I want to present it. The believability scale will follow what the investigators are trying to push for. Most of the soap, well, not the Russia now. <laughs> That's what they call them. Russia's government is pushing this towards climate. They're saying they don't really want to give, in your words, any credence to anything foul play, supernatural, nothing like that. Their conspiracies, no. They are trying to say... This was done because of bad climate conditions. That, and that is the only thing they want any investigators to be doing there. So the believability scale for this episode will be whether or not we believe that their deaths were due to bad climate. Okay. So if we think it was something supernatural, we would go unbelievable. If we think that it was weather or something naturally occurring, believable. Cool? Yes, I understand. All right. Let's go into what the leading current scientific theory is slab avalanche 
slab avalanche. A slab avalanche. Like, not just like a regular, like an avalanche on a slab. Well, there's no evidence for a regular avalanche. At one point in time, they did think it was an avalanche, because it would make sense. If you're sleeping and you start hearing snow rushing, you'll run out. It could explain the hypothermia. It the could crawling e- back. It could even explain some of the wounds. Yeah, like the crushing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The issues with it are, one, the tent was not fully covered by snow. You'd expect it to be fully covered by snow. Mm-hmm. Two, they weren't running. They were walking. Right, right. Three, it didn't cover the footprints. <laughs> and and there's no radiation that you would assume that would come from the snow. But here's where they're kind of backing it up. because So they move from it being a traditional avalanche on what you would see on TV or a movie to a slab avalanche. Basically, what they said was because they put their their tent on the slope, they had to kind of cut the cut the snow to get it in, uh-huh. and that loosened some of the top layer of the snow, and then add in hours and hours of incredibly intense wind gathering and pushing snow. So what they're thinking is it wasn't like an intense massive avalanche; it was like a top layer of like chunks of snow. And these aren't people standing where it's like hitting them in the legs or anything like that. Like they're laying down Mm -hmm. parallel with the ground or I guess the slope. So imagine you're sleeping in a tent and then huge chunks of snow fly on top of you. Oh. So that could potentially lead to some of the internal injuries. I see. Without having. So as of now, without going too much more into the science of what a slab avalanche is, that's kind of like overview. That's kind of like the leading theory right now. This is a good time to mention it. That Frozen, you know the movie Frozen? I Yeah, 2013 or it, it might have come out in 2012. Either way, great movie. I love the first one. Second one, dog shit. Well, here's the thing about the second one. I heard an article that the- You heard an article? <laughs> I heard about an article and I read it that the animation from Frozen 2 has helped determine- how the snow might have fallen on the Dyatlov Pass. Yeah. The Dyatlov. The Dyatlov Pass incident. Frozen 2 models actually worked with um, researchers to determine basically what you said, that the avalanche can easily break bones. They're like, all right, guys, this movie sucks. So <laughs> we have to make something good come out of it. So maybe we can solve like a 60-year-old mystery. No? Like, oh, yes. Yeah. Like, thanks for solving the mystery. The movie still sucks. <laughs> I like but, the movie. Yeah, you're wrong. Unbelievable. The next theory, extremely high winds. The winds made the tent inhabitable, so they quickly left for cover in the forest, and they died because it was cold. Okay. Also with that one is the theory that when they were around the tent, the wind was so strong that it literally blew one of the hikers away. Oh. Like he got lip, he got, or she, you know, whoever. Yeah. They got, uh, it was, while Yuri was there, it was eight guys and two girls. Just mm-hmm. for what, for whatever that's worth, it is what it is. But the theory is that the wind might have actually picked somebody up off the ground, blew them way back, and everybody from the tent on the drop of a dime, because they're good people, apparently, left the tent to go save whoever it was. And it was snowing. It was a blizzard. They couldn't see. They couldn't find their way back. And they died. I have a question. Yeah, I don't have an answer because okay. th- this is a mystery. But I'll can let... can any of these theories stack? Like, could it be wind and an avalanche and whatever. Oh yeah, I mean nobody knows. It could be. Okay. I mean, how would you? Here's here's what. Instead of stacking the theories, I try and, and think about in terms of stacking the evidence. Like, what do we know? We know footprints. We know they left ill prepared, so they left in a hurry. We know there was radiation. We know that people got hit with an intense force. That's where I try and stack it. Like, like we can try and take each one of these and see if it checks those off. Like high winds could probably cause the trauma. I imagine depending on how they land. I don't think three of them would have got blown off, but maybe they did. If we're going to, if we're going to believe that one person got blown away, let's just say four of them did. But where does the radiation come into play? And why do the footprints make it look like they're walking rather than running? And even, and I say this trying to pretend I'm a good person if somebody got blown away, I think I'd still put clothes on <laughs> yeah. before I'd go out. Like, how, what good are you going to do? If, if, if you're half naked, you're not helping them and you're not helping yourself. I, if it was the guy that got voted, I'd be, I would have zipped that bitch up, <laughs> turned that mini stove on, ate their damn food, broke that mandolin, and not let them back in. Lock that door of the 
tent. He's like, who sits. Sits by the te- the, 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 who sits by the door, drafty door now? Yeah, not me. Just try and vote me out. What is a Survivor? Love Survivor. All right, let's 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 stay on the topic of wind really quick and dive into the next theory, which is called infrasound. Are you familiar with infrasound? No. Okay, so there's this thing called Carmen Vortex Street, which is basically when an incredibly intense wind is just completely blocked in the middle by a blunt object, which in this case is the mountain. Okay. So this intense wind breaks, hits the mountain, causing it to kind of spiral around it in opposite directions, kind of like, I mean, don't think of it like this, but like mini tornadoes, like like circling wind. And what this does, or they what they assume this could generate is infrasound, which is an incredibly super, super low frequency. And the way it affects humans is basically your ears hear it, like the little hairs or the little bones, whatever, in your ears, the, the cochlear, or not, that's like cochlear implants, but what are those little bones? Like the smallest bones in your body or in your ear, I don't remember what they're called. And it, maybe it's not them. Your ears hear the sound, and it sends the message to your brain, and it's like, bro, do you hear that? But your brain's like, no, I don't hear anything. This is weird. So it it actually is known to give people panic attacks. Oh, really? So that wind could have caused them to freak out, not know how to handle the situation, have panic attacks, have anxiety. They're, and remember, bringing context back in, they're sleep deprived, they're tired, they're cold, they're tense, they're not getting along well, they're on the edge already. So maybe this infrasound just pushed them over the edge, so to speak. Now, doesn't stack everything up, unless you add this, so they, that makes them leave the tent. You know, they get that that intense feeling of anxiety, the panic attack, which makes them leave the tent. Maybe they were arguing. Maybe they were fighting. Leave, and then maybe other things happen, yeah, like the avalanche a, or the wind. They're pulling a Harry Potter number seven, where Ron leaves the tent. Yeah. How does that one sound to you? How does the carbon oh, the vortex infrasound? straight sound? Yeah. Uh, well, we're not in the discussion yet. No, I just want to... I, I, uh, it kind of sounds like bullshit to me, but <laughs> not going to lie. All right, well, let's go to your alley then. UFOs! Yes! Talk yes! about them aliens. Let's go. So what could this mean? Well, one, it could explain why they ran away from the tent. It could explain why certain body parts were missing. You know, aliens be doing creepy stuff with eyeballs and tongues. It could, if they had like a space gun or item, it could cause the trauma. A space gun. Something, some ray gun. I don't know what aliens use. No, no, it's good. It's good. It's or, good. or they got abducted and dropped. Picked up, dropped. Also could explain radiation. Mm-hmm. So we got we got a lot of interesting things going on here. And let me add a couple more details that I purposefully saved until now. Another group of hikers in the area that didn't die reported seeing bright orange spheres oh. in the sky to the north in the general vicinity of the Dyatlov group. The local tribe noticed orange orbs in the sky as oh, well similar evidence mm-hmm. mm. and i only saw one source that said this but in addition to the journal they also had a camera which will come into another theory i have later they say one of the photos they took was of the night sky and there were like lights in it oh gosh they but saw them coming i don't know if i believe that because like i said before if i take my, my camera now my great cell phone that'll be paid off soon and take a picture of it I'm not going to see anything in the sky. I can barely see the moon. It's like a stupid, stupid, like, circle that you can't really... You know what I'm mm. where you're trying to draw a circle and like, you can't do it because mm. you don't have a protractor? But a UFO would a compass, be closer, a compass. right? Yeah, a compass. But yeah, a, I don't know. A UFO would be closer. Maybe I don't brighter. Mmm. Mmm, that's tasty. Mm. And finally, on this one, the lead investigator of the case noted that the tops of the trees had been singed but only the top, as if something landed in the area and affected the treetops. Now, I'll note it that that detail was left out of the official report, but the investigator said it's because the Soviet Union politicians wanted the investigation, like I said, to focus solely on the climate, weather conditions. They didn't want any of these heebie-jeebie stuffs coming into play. So that's one theory, well, of many. Next... The Yeti. This is this is a big one. Are you sure we're not going through all seventy of these theories? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got I got a couple more. The Yeti. This is a really popular one, but I don't know why. I think people just like to believe that an, an abominable Yeti is up there. 
hundred percent. I will say I don't believe this one. Now I'm not saying I don't believe Yeti are out there lurking around watching hikers. You know, they say, and I'll bring it back to the camera thing. Apparently there was a photo taken that in, in, in the frame, people deduce that the Yeti is in it. Like why oh, really? stalking towards him? I, you... I haven't seen it. Okay. okay. I haven't seen it. I don't know. That's what they say. So I don't know. Okay. I do know this though. Well, I'll, 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 I'll pitch it. I'll pitch it first. So they're in the tent. They hear something walking around outside. They cut open a waist high hole so they can peer outside and see what's stalking them. They see it's this Yeti. Then they cut the tent open. They dart out. The Yeti is stronger than the average human, so it can swipe and slash and punch and DDT these people and give them their their intense car wreck-like broken body parts, bones, internal organs, what have you. And that's all I got. Because I'm just it's, because it's not true. I'm just thinking about the Yeti from Monsters, Inc. Yeah, the um blue the blue guy no the, the oh the the i know sorry. the yeti yeah, yeah the yeti the, the actual yeti. yeti guy he's a good guy he was a good guy i think you would do um that. i would assume if this was the case one they wouldn't be walking away they'd be running two you would see its footprints three i think you would see the damage done to the bodies if it was like as you'll see in this there's very few animal Animals did it. Like, wolves did it. Wolverines did it. I mean, there were wolves, wolverines, bears in this area. Like, these are known animals to this location. So you would assume if the details and the descriptions matched, people would have theories that it was these animals. But there was no external injuries. It wasn't like there was a slash or a cut or anything like that. It was internal. It was like a pressure. They got hit by a pressure. So, as fun as it is, just, it doesn't hold up. No radiation either. Unless, yeah, no. unless these are glowing green yetis that are yeah i don't i don't i don't think it's a yeti that doesn't seem to make sense to me all right this is the last theory before we get to the discussion i just have to ask you said there was one theory you kind of bought into oh yeah and i don't want you to say it yet okay have i said it yet yes okay so the last theory military testing and there's a few theories that point to this so i'm going to try and break those down it's kind of it's like a theory within a theory because there's there's multiple different angles that it comes with so i'll do my best to lay that out as clear as possible. So let me add context. Again, this is the 50s, the late 50s, Cold War area, tensions are high, military advancements, it's it's you know, it's just trying to make sure you have the edge and a lot of military tests were hush hush. So, could what have startled the hikers have been a missile test? Now, uh you are 100 missile. I have no idea what that is. It's like we were talking about William's gun. I have no idea what that is. I assume is. it's a big missile. It's big, whatever yeah. it is. But apparently a part of that, that missile or a shell, some part of it was actually discovered on that mountain at a later time. Now, the UR-100, apparently from what I, what I saw, because again, I don't know, it didn't actually come out until six years later. But that doesn't mean that these couldn't have been very early tests for what it would become. So... Maybe this spooked the hikers. Obviously, you're hearing a missile and you run out to your own demise. Now, also a theory is that they shot the missile up in the air and that was the orange glow that other hikers and the Manzi tribe saw. And singed the trees. And singed the trees. Yeah, see, we're stacking them up. And then the hikers came out and they took pictures and the government didn't like that. Obviously, they're trying to keep things hush hush. They're trying to do these experiments on their technology and military equipment in a rural area. I doubt they expected hikers to be there. Maybe they took the hikers. Maybe they interrogated the hikers. Maybe they tortured the hikers. Maybe mm-hmm. they killed the hikers. So that's a theory there that it was sh- the missile shot up in the sky. That's what they saw. It was mistaken for aliens. They were taking pictures. The government found out that other people witnessed them testing the weapons and bad juju for the hikers. That theory starts so strong for me. And then it just, for me, it just ends on like a whimper. Yeah? Yeah. Another theory that is staying within this realm of the military and the government is that they were testing out a pure energy ray gun. Oh. Now, this highly electrical ray beam would have been so specific that, one, it would have led to radiation to the bodies, but it wouldn't have led to radiation around the entire area because it was so 
focused, which okay. there wasn't radiation found in the area. They tested trees in the area and they found a little bit of radiation, but not intensive radiation. So unless they had a cleanup, you know, plan from the gods, I don't think they would be able to like scrape every tree in the forest. And only one body had radiation, right? Yeah. That could have singed the top of the trees. Obviously, a ray gun, a ray beam would have spooked the hikers out of the tent. And getting hit by that could have caused the pressure injuries without damaging the skin. And that could have led to some of the other things like the gray green skin, the red skin, obviously all the radiation things. So if we assume that it was purely a test for a remote location and it accidentally killed the hikers, not intentionally. I don't think they went out there, saw hikers and were like, let's kill them. I think it was, if this is true, I think it was, let's test out this weapon Oh, shit. There were people there. <laughs> it would justify pretty much everything we said. It's like slow motion. Oh, no. <laughs> right. So the theory then would lead to the idea that it was a cover up. Yeah. So, oh, shit. We killed these people. We can't let anybody else know because then we'd have to explain what killed them. And some details that kind of I, I, I once again held until now to sprinkle on there. One when they found the tent, it was incorrectly erected, which again, remember, these are experienced, skilled hikers. It is very unlikely that they would improperly put up a tent. Two, apparently, there was a letter dated on February 16th, which was six days before the bodies were found that mentioned the prosecutor's office was aware of the deaths and were going to investigate. Also... There was damage to the bodies post-death. It's a fancier name for it than that. Post-mortem? Mm, that, that, that's after death, but there's a name for when you... It, I think it starts with an L, where you like uh, you alter the body after death. Oh, okay. Like, if damage... If, if something happened after they died, there's a name for that. Apparently, that was discovered on the bodies. So, did they go in there and rearrange how it was found, reposition the bodies... To make it look like an avalanche or something happened naturally to kill them. And is that why they want all the focus and the energy in the investigation to be focused on a climate disaster? And those are the theories. And let's head to the discussion. Okay, so I think the way we should handle this is we should each pick which theory we stand behind the most. Even if I'm not saying we have to say I think this happened, but okay. the the one that we buy the most, even if it's not 100 percent. And then again, for this episode, the believability scale is whether or not we believe that it was a natural disaster, as in the wind, the infrasound, an avalanche, a sub, a slab avalanche. If it's one of those, we would go believable. But if it's the UFO, if it's the Yeti, even the military experiment, because that's not natural climate to okay. cover up. Where where are you at mentally? How are you feeling today? How are you doing today, by the way? I didn't ask. I'm good. I'm good. All right. What do you think? So I think we all know where I'm going to go. <laughs> you, you're biased. I am. But I think it's hypothermia mixed with aliens. That sounds to me the most plausible. So like the ones that died from hypothermia were running from the aliens and the four that were found with radiation skin in the physical trauma had been abducted abducted let me tell you a tale i'm ready to hear it let me spin this yarn all right so what i think happened they're hiking right they're hiking normal hiking yep all of a sudden four hikers go missing six of them go what was that and then they're looking for them they don't know where they went they vanished they set up their tent hurriedly because it's cold it's getting dark they didn't realize how late it's getting right they forgot to set it up properly they get cold they forgot about the stuff they had because, like you said, they're exhausted, they're worried, they're confused. All of a sudden, someone starts acting strange in the tent. And this is the hypothermia kicking in. And he starts attacking his fellow tent members. Does hypothermia make you do that? Yes. I, sorry, I don't want to interrupt your No, it's your, okay. Your yeah, yarn. yeah, it does. Hypothermia does crazy stuff. Um, it makes you hungry. It makes you think you're actually hot. So he starts attacking people in the tent. They cut their way out. That would also explain taking off the clothes. Yeah, it would. So they're walking away because they're not, they're tired. They can't run. They're very tired. They're also half naked. So that's the hypothermia. A couple days later, we get these bodies in the river and these were alien victims. For some reason, the experiments went out of hand. 
and they did things to these bodies and they needed to destroy them. So if they thought they put them in a freezing river, they wouldn't be found, but they were because they were found months later, right? Two months, two yeah. months after. Two and that just comes down to the aliens time. not understanding Earth's environment. And that's my theory, how hypothermia and aliens mix. I like it. That's, that's fun. Thank you. So, so you go unbelievable. Yes. Okay. For me, aliens are easily the second option for me. They're What's the, the first? The military. Oh, okay. There's, I, I think this is a cover-up. For me, there's just too much that points to it. One, if they found a missile shell there. And I'm not saying it was the energy beam. I'm not saying it was necessarily a missile. I, I don't know the weapon. Maybe nobody knows. You know, Well, whoever did it would know. They're probably dead now. It was a long time ago. But um, I think they were testing something, whether or not it was on purpose or it was an accident. I think it spooked and absolutely terrified and affected the members. And I think they didn't want to, I don't, I don't think they wanted people to know what weapon they were testing. So they didn't want to answer any questions. And so they covered it up to make it look like they just had a, a freak out moment. I think that plays into them finding the shell or whatever part of the missile. The fact that that letter came out six days before they were actually found. The fact that the government only wants them to focus on weather related events or catastrophes. So for me, that's number one. UFOs are number two because it works. It, I mean, <laughs> even if you don't believe in aliens or UFOs, it it's more plausible than a Yeti. Maybe we're all wrong. Maybe the wind just literally blew someone away. And they're like, hey. wait. <laughs> and then they came back. And then, you know, I mean, maybe. But in terms of trying to f- check all of the boxes that fit the most descriptions that we get and the details we get, I think R2 are the top two. Would, what, would the military be your second or what would be your second? My second is one you didn't cover. Yeah. Which is the, the asteroid exploding yeah which is i don't know the the only problem with that is the the forests the trees and everything weren't affected if something blew up and it cracked you would have had a media a, a bigger meteorite landing site it would have affected the trees yeah there's lots of problems a lot a bunch of shit i don't know <laughs> a lot of problems, <laughs> i don't know i don't a lot know of problems a lot of shit so that is our episode on the diatlov pass incident Okay, so that was our episode. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a pretty popular one. A couple of people did hit us up and say we should talk about it. And I do want to apologize one more time for not saying all their names or like going. There, there are other shows and articles that go very detailed into their each hiker's personal life, more of their hour to hour experiences, what they did in each city before they even actually began their hike. And that's all incredibly interesting. And I, if you like the subject, if you love the mystery here, I would totally recommend checking that out more. We're not, I mean, just face value, we're not necessarily known as a deep dive podcast. Right. Which is okay. That's, I mean, we know what lane we're in. This is what, this Absolutely. Is what we do. Um, Time Stock does a really good deep dive into it. Yeah. But for us, it's a longer episode. So. Yes. Uh, yeah. But it's like, I, I felt like I did an overview, but even with that, there was just so much stuff I was like, I can't leave out. It but is it, still it's a, a rich, delicious caviar Russian episode. When you said rich, I was thinking cheesecake, and then you said caviar, and now I want to vomit. <laughs> I love caviar. So I hope you have. I hope you've listened to this episode with a shot of vodka and some cream cheese and caviar and every other Russian stereotype. I, that's how I'm going to listen to it. I hope you found it interesting. It's just crazy. The deeper you dive into it, the crazier it is. It's like tongues missing, eyes missing. It's like, okay. If I said somebody was missing an eyebrow, you'd be like, oh, maybe he got burned off. It was literally ripped. Like some, but something caused somebody's eyebrow and all the skin behind it to rip off that you could see the skull like what does that does an mm. avalanche do that aliens do. come on russia slash soviet union slash ussr how many names do you need in 50 years <laughs> anyway if you guys have theories if you guys have a favorite idea of what could have happened let us know we'd love to talk about it with you if you also thought frozen 2 is trash let us know boo <laughs> And remember, if you're enjoying the show, hit us up on Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. It helps us out a lot. We love seeing what you say, sharing it with each other, sharing it with our Instagram. They like seeing it, maybe. Yeah, I think so. And if you're feeling like you want to rock the show on a shirt, we have our merchandise up on our website. That's right. So check that out. Get a shirt. Reasonably priced. But (laughs) as always, thank you so much for listening. I'm Tyler. I'm Charlie. And catch us next week on Believing the Bizarre podcast as bizarre as you are.